See this? This isn't you having something against your brother. This is you realizing that your brother has something against you. Right? And Jesus, I showed you these texts before. He covers both bases. This is where he says, if you're coming to the altar and you realize that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way and first be what? Reconcile, Reconcile to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Okay? So go and be reconciled. Peacemaking involves a commitment to restoring damaged relationships and negotiating just agreements. Now, it works on both parts. Whether you're the offended one or whether you're the one that did the offending. This last verse, you were the one that did offending. You offended your brother. You realize that. Before you come and give your gift at the altar, you need to try to be reconciled to your brother. It also works the other way because there's other passages where it says that if you're the one doing the offending, you need to be reconciled to your brother or sister. Okay? Do you guys remember what the gold, the gold rule is? Matthew 7, 12? See? The gold rule. We all remember they taught me that in, uh, I think, first or second grade. The nuns went over that and over that and over that. Therefore... Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye so even to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Okay? That how you want to be treated is how you should treat others. Now, does that mean only those that are nice to you, you should treat them nice? That is everyone that you come in contact with. Was there a difference between Jesus and his character? His nature. Notice that last part. And the uh, twelve disciples, their character and their nature. It's a loaded question, so don't be afraid. It's a loaded question. Now, the character, you can say, yeah, there's a definite difference between Jesus' character and the twelve disciples' character, right? Jesus. Jesus' nature. Who is his mother? Right? So how DNA and genetics work. His mother was Mary. What kind of nature did he take? The nature of his mother, right? It's not hard to figure out. Okay. Now, his father was the Holy Spirit. So he also had the nature of his father as well, right? But he took on the nature of Mary in her fallen state. But there was a difference between Jesus and those 12 men. And what the difference was? He had no propensity to sin. Do you understand what that word means? We went over this in my Sabbath school. What that word means is that Jesus lived and he had a selfless, not a selfish, but a selfless center to himself. When he interacted with his world, it was through selflessness. You saw that all through his life. A great example of this is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. He teaches them all day, he heals their sick, casts out demons, he gets late. And the disciples come to him and say, send the people away so they can get something to eat. The disciples cared about them not having anything to eat, but they didn't care enough to take care of themselves. That was a selfish, no, that was a selfish form of compassion. You guys see that? That's us. That was his disciples. Send them away. Send these people away so they can get something to eat. What was Jesus' response to his disciples? He said, you feed them. You feed them. And what was their response to him saying, you feed them? Now listen. In our vernacular, it would be, man, are you crazy? There's 5,000 men plus women and children. And they looked in Judas's purse and there was only enough to buy a couple loaves of bread. Do you see the difference? Jesus, the Bible tells you that Jesus had compassion on the people. And his disciples come and say, send them away, dismiss them now so they can go and get something to eat so they don't fall out as they're walking back to their houses. Jesus said, you feed them. 
selfishness, selflessness. Their compassion, they have compassion on the crowd, is that right? Yes. But not enough compassion to take care of their needs themselves because they didn't think they could. Jesus, on the other hand, knew that he could and he was going to meet their needs. Everything he did was done out of selflessness. When he went to the cross, did he have to go? Did he not tell his disciples that if he wanted, he could ask his father and his father could send legions? Not just one legions, but many legions of angels. He willingly went, selflessly went. That's the difference between Jesus and us. If Jesus does not live inside of your heart, and if you're not controlled by the Holy Spirit, then you will live your life according to selfishness. This is what the Holy Spirit does for you. Is it gives you a new creation. What is the creation? It takes the selfishness and now gives you the ability to look at life and put others before yourself. Selflessness. Garrett. We mentioned earlier that Jesus was. Speak out, we mentioned earlier that Jesus was completely surrendered to His Father's will. He gave everything He had. That was His Father's will. He could yes. have changed, but He always said, "Whatever Your will be done." Yes. He was surrendered. From the moment He woke up to the time He went to bed, He was in continual surrender to whatever His Father wanted—a life of self. So, he tells his disciples, you feed them. They said, we can't feed them. We don't have anything to feed them with. Somewhere in that crowd was this young boy, right? Now, do you really think one of those disciples went and saw this kid about to eat his lunch and said, kid, we need that thing. Come here. What I think is that the kid was somewhere close to where they were having this discussion and went to Jesus or his disciples, actually went to the disciples and said, I have my lunch, you can have that. Think about this, because this is what Jesus calls us for. This is a converted heart compared to the disciples' unconverted heart. The kid gave all that he had and did not ask any questions. There's a need. This is what I have. I give it all to you. Right? And Jesus took that and he multiplied it. Now, did you ever wonder why, and I asked this to my Sabbath school class, how many fragments, how many baskets of fragments were taken up? Twelve. Why wasn't there eleven? Why wasn't there thirteen? How many disciples were there? Twelve. How many disciples handing out these baskets? And now you know why there was 12 leftovers. Okay, baskets full. Why? It was to show these guys and to increase their faith. And to show them the difference between Christ and his selflessness Amen. and them and their selfishness. You guys see that? Does it make sense to you? That's what Christ calls us for. That is the life that we're supposed to live. And it can only be done by what Gary said, and that is a continual submission to the will of God. Amen. Now listen, we go through this over and over again. Just because you've accepted Christ as your Savior, and He's made a new creation out of you, does that mean he's take, that, that that's taken away that old sinful nature? No. Doesn't the book of Romans and Galatians tell you that? This old man of sin needs to be crucified. And it needs to be crucified daily, as Jesus said. Take up your cross daily. Right? Paul writes that the flesh wars against the spirit. And the spirit wars. Now, if you look at the King James, it says lusts. The flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit lusts against the flesh. It means war. It's a battle. It's a constant battle, constant struggle. So either you surrender and you walk in the Spirit, which is what Paul over and over says, no longer walk in the flesh, but walk in the Spirit, or you don't surrender and you walk in the flesh. That was the difference between the disciples on that day 
where Jesus fed 5,000 and the disciples after Jesus appeared to them and they went out and wrote the book of Acts. Okay? They finally stopped walking in flesh and they finally got it right and understood what it meant to walk in the Spirit. What did it take? It took their hearts to be broken. You guys understand that? Their hearts to be broken. All of their dreams, all of their hopes for this Messiah was dashed. And they had to come to full submission that what they thought the Messiah would do was not what he came to actually do. And they had to submit to what God wanted them to finally do. Can I see that? So, we are called to glorify God. This is how we do it when it comes to conflict. And that in every, every, every form of conflict, God allows that to happen because God will give you the opportunity to glorify Him if you submit to His glory. Yeah. Did that help? Yes. Some have asked if we could write this on paper and hand it out. No, I can't write that on paper because I don't have time to do that. If you like to sit here and copy this, it's here. It's here all week. If you want to take a picture on your phone, you can take that and copy it from there. Uh, but all these scriptures, especially these ones over here, I don't have time to go through them this week. We'll get into these more next week. Okay? Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 625.